What's up, Sushi Squad? We back in with some more Genshin Impact. And today, I'm going to be doing a long overdue beginner's guide. So this is going to be in very in-depth, telling you hopefully everything you need to know about the game, how to play it, how to do this, how to do that. Uh, I will have timestamps. I don't know what's going on here. I'll ignore her. I will have uh, timestamps in the description so that you guys can end up just skipping to individual categories of each of the topics. Now, keep in mind that while I am going Going to try and have these uh you know kind of key points as it were certain topics are going to kind of be a subcategory of item or topic or something like like i'll talk about characters and then i'll talk about weapons and then domains and stuff like that i'll talk about a little bit later in the video even though those will end up coming into play directly with characters and weapons etc etc so anyways First and foremost, what is Genshin Impact? Genshin Impact is a completely free to play game. So keep that in mind. Uh, that does have a cash shop and it does have pay to win. Uh, I will end up talking about the cash shop and all that stuff way, way later in the video. So again, you can check the uh, timestamps in the description if you want. But uh, the reason that it is just popping off is because, I mean, look at this for a free to play game already looks amazing uh and it is actually an open world exploration game very very similar to uh zelda breath of the wild if you guys haven't explored or tried that game out basically it means that we get uh, a huge massive expansive map to end up exploring uh while also having uh, a bunch of different elemental physics systems in place uh which in breath of the wild for example you could set grass on fire in genshin impact you can also set grass on fire uh but the elemental elemental system kind of goes to the extreme in Genshin Impact where you have certain characters that will have certain elements and certain elements can end up complementing one another etc etc we'll get into all of these subsystems as we end up uh talking a little bit further on in the video but i just want to give you guys a brief heads up about what the game is uh the game on top of all of that is on mobile devices pc and PS4, and it's coming to Nintendo Switch. We don't know when yet. Uh, as far as I know, there is cross save between PC and mobile devices. PS4, you're gonna have your own individual save file. Uh, so basically, if you start playing on PC, you cannot transfer that data over to PS4, but the game is entirely cross play. So I can, while I'm on PC, play with anyone that's on PS4 regardless, because that is something different. I would assume that the Switch is probably going to end up having cross saves between PC and mobile, just because the way that PS4 handles its local files is very different, but maybe the Switch will end up being separate files, who knows. Um, I am playing this on a controller, so you can actually very easily just set up your controller devices and then you just go into the settings and then you swap it out there. Uh, I just wanted to give that as a heads up because lots of people always ask me, are you playing this with controller? Are you playing on console? No, I'm playing it on PC. That's why we have the graphics absolutely cranked. Oh, and the other important thing is that this game also has online co-op and you can play with a total of four people in your world. So that's four people, including the host. The way that it all works, well, we'll explain that a little bit later, but for those of you that actually know a little bit about what's going on in this game, you are going to have to get to Adventure Rank 16 in order to unlock co-op, and we'll explain Adventure Rank later in the video for those that don't know. Anyways, let's get into the actual bulk of the tutorial, okay? Because there is a lot that we have to cover. Uh, so first and foremost, we're going to be talking about the characters, uh, and then we'll get into the weapons, artifacts, and elements, and stuff like that. Uh, so the characters themselves you're going to end up playing the game and as a free-to-play player you will end up having access to certain characters that you will end up unlocking through the main story whereas other characters you might end up being able to trial through the main story like maybe there will be a mission where uh you end up doing a story mission and you can control mona which is this water mage character but that doesn't necessarily mean that the game is unlocking her for you now, the way that you'll unlock characters that aren't tied to the free progression story characters is you will have to end up either spending money or by grinding the game and doing your daily commissions and stuff like that, which again, we'll get into all of that stuff later on. Uh, you'll end up earning for the bulk of the game, including achievements and stuff, 
Prima Gems. Now, Prima Gems are going to end up being a cash shop resource that free to play players can grind at an alarmingly slower rate than just spending money, obviously. Uh, but that's where these wishes will come into place. So the wishes are going to end up kind of changing up periodically. Uh, these individual wishes here are actually called banners so if you ever hear a player referring to a banner uh it's not as complex as it seems but basically this is going to end up being a permanent banner that is never going away whereas the weapon banner and the character banner are limited time now the way that these work is quite literally you will end up spending your prima gems uh in order to end up buying a fate which is you can kind of see like uh let me see can i pull up a map or, or pull up a okay well anyways you can get acquiant fate in order to end up using them on the limited time banner and then you can get intertwined fate for the other one it's just so that they're set uh, separated but basically if you have prima gems you can do one wish at a time and that can end up unlocking various characters, okay? Uh, it's going to show you all of the rates if you end up going into the details. So that's the drop percentage and stuff. Five star, of course, is the absolute rarest. There is a pity system in place so that every 90 rolls will guarantee you a five star character. But more than likely, you're going to get a five star character before that. Uh, because the way that the pity system works is uh, apparently once you get to your 70th roll, the percentage of success rate towards getting a five star character increases and it increases and it increases until finally you just get 100% at the 90 roll but I don't know anybody who's actually taken 90 total rolls to get a five star character but my point being that it can end up being pretty brutal now at the beginning of the game they're gonna throw you tons and tons of prime and gems but as you end up getting further into the game and start getting into your daily commissions and stuff it's going to end up getting a lot harder to end up getting them but uh basically you can end up getting four star characters uh sometimes weapons and stuff like that for four stars you'll get those guaranteed every 10 rolls so that's significantly easier to do uh, and then three star is gonna be just weapons and stuff uh, there's no three star characters in the game right now who knows if they'll ever add them uh, but basically four star is characters and five star is stronger characters right so through this uh you know permanent banner you can see that it's going to end up having this set amount of five star items and characters whereas the other banners uh are going to end up having different five star items so this one has five star weapons in particular this one has certain five star and four star characters that are not available in this banner okay now i know that that was a bit of a longer explanation but my point is that based on your luck you can end up getting a plethora of different characters and each of them is going to end up having their own different playstyle and abilities so mona for example is a water mage as i as i had mentioned and now we can actually swap into the next topic of uh elemental abilities so there's gonna be a bunch of different elements in the game uh that are all going to end up having their own specific function with mona being a water mage it means that if we tag an enemy with any of our attacks she is going to wet them that is going to be a condition that is going to end up being on the enemy and when an enemy is wet you can combine that with different elements to end up having an effect so razor for example is an electric melee character and his basic attack isn't going to do any electricity uh but your special attack is going to and by using my special attack on an enemy that's wet it's going to conduct electricity between a bunch of enemies and ultimately end up doing a lot more elemental damage and a lot more bang for your buck the way that this gets even more complicated is that certain enemies might have a certain element tied to them. So, for example, if I'm fighting a, an enemy that is electric, obviously Razor, who is an electric character, is going to have a tough time defeating it, as opposed to a fire character, which fire will end up destroying electric enemies. But maybe I'm fighting an enemy that is on fire and it is a conductor for the electricity uh, or maybe I'm fighting water slimes so they're just going to be taking lots of damage in the first place and that is kind of the beauty of this game because with each of the characters having their own elemental abilities it means that you can end up combining certain characters to end up synergizing them very well with one another and this furthermore ends up coming into play when you are playing online multiplayer because 
because this game does have online multiplayer now the point being is that when you're playing in single player you can just cycle through your characters and you're gonna have to manually cast one ability and then chain it together with another ability whereas if you end up having somebody join you in multiplayer uh, basically, the way that the game's going to work is it's always going to prioritize the host. So if one person joins my world, I will be able to swap between one and two characters. And then the other player will be able to swap between three and four. So, you know, three and four. Because you can only ever have four characters at a time, just like you can only have four players in your world at a time. So if you have three players in your world, including the host, basically every single character is going to be taken and you're going to be stuck playing as just one. You can always end up changing them, uh, changing the character that you're playing as by going through the party setup. But the point being why it's so much easier in multiplayer is because rather than me having to tag an enemy with water, then swap to razor and use electric, somebody else might already just be doing constant water damage that is going to just trigger with me using Razor and my normal electric abilities, right? All right, so moving on to the next step. Now we're going to be talking about the equipment menu, let's say. So we're going to be talking about weapons, artifacts, constellations, and talents. Uh, first and foremost is going to be attributes. Now, attributes is quite literally just the level of your character. And as you can see in the top right, you can see the level of your character and the attributes that are going to end up upgrading. The crazy thing is that every single one of these categories is significant to one specific character and can all end up being invested in. So there's one category for attributes, for example, while another category is related to your talents, which is your skill points and, uh, or skills and special abilities and stuff like that, which are both going to level up individual of one another. Yeah. So anyways, with attributes, the way that this game deals with leveling is actually going to be quite different than what you might expect, because rather than just killing a bunch of mobs and gaining experience and leveling up that way, uh, the opposite is true. You're actually not going to get that much experience from fighting mobs at all. Uh, what the game actually promotes you doing is exploring the map and finding treasure chests and completing quests and stuff like that so that you can end up getting these scrolls or papers or whatever. These literally are are chunks of XP that you can spend on a character. And, and we'll talk about the map and exploration and chess and stuff like that and kind of the gameplay loop of this game a little bit later in the video because now we're on the category of uh, characters and attributes. But basically, the higher the level of your character, the more of these scrolls you're going to have to spend. And then on top of the scrolls, you are also going to end up spending Mora, which is the in-game currency. And I want to reiterate the fact that you are going to end up getting a lot of items early on. So like I said, you're going to get lots of Prima gems, but you're also going to end up gaining a lot of these scrolls early on in the game. And then the further you play into the game, it's going to become rarer and rarer. Or maybe not necessarily rarer, but you'll have less things to do. Thus, you'll have less opportunity to end up grinding any of these items to level up your characters. So... With that said, be very careful which character you decide to end up leveling up and investing in. Because as you level them up, it's going to become exceedingly more expensive in terms of the experience that you need to spend on their attributes, as well as ascensions. Now, ascending a character, you can kind of see Venti right in the top right. Uh, I've got two stars under Venti, which means I have ascended him twice. So if you end up leveling up a character up by 10 level intervals, you are going to end up getting to the point where you have to do what the game calls ascending that character. And to ascend characters, it is actually going to cost very, very specific resources that you will end up getting from domains or world bosses or what have you. And uh, uh, we'll talk about those categories a little bit later in the video just because they are something kind of separate. Uh, but the whole thing is that while you might not gain much XP from fighting random mobs out in the environment, it does still pay to fight pretty much everything you come across because every single enemy in the game can end up dropping a very specific resource and these resources will end up being spent on ascending characters leveling up weapons leveling up artifacts and stuff like that right so you gotta end up 
keeping all of these for ascending uh, the various categories of items, okay? So anyways, now we can end up moving on from the attributes, I guess, uh, and move on to weapons. Uh, so weapons... Weapons are going to end up being a little bit more forgiving in that you can end up swapping the weapons from character to character. So, like I mentioned, you got to be very careful which character you decide to main. Make sure it's something that you think is cool and that you enjoy. There's lots of tier lists online about certain characters being better than others. But considering that this is going to end up being a gacha game, a loot box game, a, you know, they add a new character, they want you to spend money in order to end up getting a chance of getting that new character... Basically, the point that I'm getting at is that the newest character usually ends up being the strongest. And rather than rebalancing every character in the game to end up fitting into that one category, they're probably just going to end up having new characters be stronger. So my point being is that a tier list now is going to be kind of irrelevant a few months or years down the line. So keep that in mind when you are investing in certain characters. It doesn't matter that much to take the opinion of others to say, why did you invest all of your levels in this one character? This character sucks. Who cares? If you enjoy that character, as far as I'm concerned, invest the heck out of it. Now, the point that I'm getting at is that weapons, obviously because they can end up swapping from character to character, are a lot less they're more important, I would say, and a lot less worry goes into leveling them up. So long as you end up having the right weapons, right? So, for example, this is the Wolf's great uh, Gravestone. It's a great sword just because I already know that I'm going to invest in having a great sword character as my main damage or DPS. Um, so I can just invest in this sword as much as I want. And speaking of Ascension, which I ended up mentioning uh, previously with the characters, you can see right here that I can't actually ascend this weapon any further until I've reached adventure rank 40. Now, I'll have a different category talking about adventure rank just because it's something a little bit, you know, it's fairly simple to understand. But again, I have timestamps in the description so you guys can check all that stuff out, right? Uh, so anyways, you can check the details of a weapon, which is going to end up having certain passive abilities to them, uh, ascending a weapon or leveling up a weapon. Uh, the way that you level up weapons is going to end up being different than your characters, though, because to level up a weapon is quite literally going to end up spending uh, other gear and items in order to level them up. So if I end up going into my enhancement materials, you can see I can literally dump other weapons, destroying those weapons, but I can dump them into this bow that I have equipped right now on Venti in order to end up leveling the bow up. Now, the most experience that you're going to get for leveling weapons up is through all of these uh crystals or gems or whatever you can see that are right here uh these you will end up forging at the smith and in order to forge them they are going to cost various ores that you'll get by being out and exploring and stuff and ores can end up respawning within a certain hourly timer per day and so on and so forth we'll, we'll get into all of that when we get into the exploration aspect of the game um but further than that there is also refining a weapon now the way that you refine a weapon is quite literally if you have two duplicates of a weapon you can end up putting the duplicate into this weapon to refine it and then end up giving the passive ability a higher stat value so you can see increase elemental skill and elemental burst damage by 30 percent is the base and if i would refine this weapon it would end up bringing it up to 36 percent instead so that's where you can kind of use your own discretion which weapons you want to invest in because do you end up investing in weapons that you have more of or do you end up investing in ones that are really, really powerful? So for me, for example, I'm investing in the Wolf's Great Sword or Gravestone Sword just because of it being perfect for my playstyle and a very powerful sword and a five star sword at that. Because as far as my bows are concerned, I only have four star bows anyways. And obviously you would use a different bow on a different character just because this guy is a support character. So we're going to end up using one that gives him more elemental burst, which... I could swap this bow out for a different one uh, depending on my playstyle and depending on where I was trying to force this character in, uh, him being a more support character, where there's other archers that will end up being more offensive and damaging characters still. So. 
I'm just trying to get my point across. Now, moving on to artifacts. Artifacts are going to end up being very similar to the way that the weapons work, except these are quite literally just going to be kind of your gear, your equipment, your armor, as it were. Now, these are going to end up being... These are going to be very, very important and unfortunately are kind of where the random stats come into the game. So you can see that there's all sorts of different uh, categories of artifacts and you can always end up going to sets of artifacts. Now, the sets are going to be important just because as you end up equipping two of the same set, for example, like you can see, this is a gladiator uh, part of the gladiator set, this helmet, and I have two uh, gladiator pieces of gear equipped right now which gives me the set bonus of 18 percent more damage which is pretty darn good if i do say so now that is where you know certain ones will end up giving you certain bonuses that are more specific to certain characters and so on and so forth so you gotta be careful which ones you end up equipping uh on which characters uh, i don't really have the most ideal loadout right now so just ignore what i have on razor it's just kind of the best that i have at the moment now, the way that you end up getting artifacts is, again, by defeating world bosses and stuff like that or doing dungeons. You can end up getting these artifacts uh, by farming very specific dungeons. But you're going to have to spend resin, which we'll get into the resin system a little bit later. But in short, it is going to end up being uh, a resource that slowly generates over time and you have a limited quantity of it per day. So you'll spend it all to end up getting some artifacts and then you got to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait unless you end up uh, using an item that ends up giving you a little bit more or just spending cash shop in order to end up getting yourself uh, more resin. But Again, we'll talk about that system a little bit later in the video, but my point is that uh, as you end up increasing your adventure rank, you can end up increasing the level of your world, and by increasing the level of your world, it's going to end up having stronger monsters come out, but chances of getting stronger drops. So you can end up getting four-star artifacts or even five-star artifacts when you start getting a lot more powerful world level and the reason why the artifacts kind of become a bit of a problem is because you can see the passive stats uh so for my gladiator weapon you can see energy recharge defense elemental mastery attack those are going to end up being passive stats rather than the set bonuses uh, and those stats are going to end up being completely random what they generate on the artifact. Now, the difference between a four-star and a five-star artifact is that a four-star artifact or even lesser tiered artifacts will only start with a set amount of stats. And as you level the artifact up, it's going to slowly unlock more and more stats. The reason why a five-star artifact is going to end up being your best option for investing your time, your effort, your items into is because it is already going to start with more stats unlocked. And so the stats, uh, rather than it unlocking more stats, it's just going to put more stats into the stats that are already unlocked. I know that kind of probably didn't make that much sense, but basically a five-star artifact is going to have more overhead for how much more powerful it can end up being versus a four-star artifact, right? But that's where the whole point of the game is going to be grinding over and over in order to end up getting an artifact that ended up actually generating with the items and stuff that you want on them, right? So uh, uh, leveling them up is going to end up being as simple as just, you know, putting pieces, uh, other artifact and gear into them or using those uh, level up crystals like I had mentioned on the weapons as well. So, uh, but that's where the game does do a pretty good job instructing you of where you'll get specific artifacts. So you can always end up pulling up your uh, adventures book or your catalog to end up looking at, okay, which dungeon specifically ends up dropping the set item that I want, etc. which again, we'll talk about domains later in the video because now we're gonna be moving on to the constellations. We won't have to spend too much time on constellations because a constellation is going to end up being different per character and is basically going to end up being passive abilities for each character. So you can see for Razor, for example, my first constellation ability is picking up an elemental orb or particle increases Razor's damage by 10% for eight seconds. Whereas the second one after that is going to increase crit rate against enemies with less than 30% HP by 10%. Okay, so... A constellation quite literally is if you end up 
using the wishes, using the banners, and you get a duplicate of a character you already unlocked, you can then end up using that duplicate character to unlock a constellation. So, for example, when the game first came out, it was very, very easy to get Barbara, and she was one of the most common wishes out of the characters, I would say, that you could get out of the banner that was in the beginning of the game. And as you can see, I and many other people was able to get her maximum constellations just because we got so many duplicates of this stupid character. She's actually a really good character. It's just I personally don't like using her. Uh, the problem is that once you end up having their max constellation, I don't think there's much reason to end up actually getting more duplicates of them. You'll just end up getting uh, certain items that you can end up using in the shop, which we'll talk about that later in the video. Moving on to talents. So talents are going to end up being the skills or abilities that you'll end up using on a character. So this is quite literally going to be leveling up your normal attacks, your special abilities, and even your ultimate ability, right? And the thing that's crazy about this is that it's going to take different resources than it does to level up your character or ascend your character's attributes. So, uh, yeah. Have fun with that. Now, one thing to point in, uh, to point out is that at any time, if you're trying to look for a piece of equipment or a you know a required material, basically, you can always end up opening up this menu that will literally tell you where to get it. So it's handy in that regard. But because of this system, it means that you have to spend so much resources upgrading your attributes, your weapons, your artifacts, potentially getting duplicates of characters for constellations and leveling up your talents just to end up getting characters super duper strong. Like personally, I think that talents should just fall under the category of attributes where as you level up the character, their uh, uh, attack abilities should just end up getting stronger and better. But I mean, whatever, everything about this game is to try and generate the most money from players as possible. Uh, not to say that you can't just grind these resources you kind of have to uh yourself but again it all ties into the resin system which you can kind of pay to win your way through uh but more importantly certain resources and specifically the in-game money and stuff like that that is going to end up being a lot easier for you to get if you end up spending real money on the game Oh, and last but not least, the profile is literally just going to be you unlocking voice lines and unlocking story elements of a character based on... I think this is just based off of doing quests for them and stuff like that. I honestly have no idea and I don't care. All right, so now that we've gotten over the characters, let's talk about Adventure Rank before we start talking about the open world map exploration and stuff because Adventure Rank is kind of the bulk of the game. Uh, it's what ends up unlocking so many different systems of the game, uh, not only related to exploration, but also related to world levels, as I mentioned previously in the, you know, artifacts and weapons category, you need to increase your world level in order to end up getting higher and better drops of gear and stuff like that. So anyways, uh, adventure rank is going to be, uh, if any time you press escape or just open your pause menu, you can see right there, I'm adventure rank. 35. Now you'll have to ignore my experience bar because I am actually over adventure rank 35 right now, but in order to increase past adventure rank 35, I have to do a specific quest. Certain levels in adventure rank will require you to do quests in order to progress further, but you can still collect adventure rank experience so it doesn't really matter if you end up postponing this or not. For example, the reason that I'm postponing going to Adventure Rank 6 is because it's going to increase my world level to world level 4, and I just frankly don't have my characters at a high enough level or powerful enough gear in order to handle world level 4 right now, so I'm just staying in world level 3. So anyways, the way you end up increasing your Adventure Rank is by literally just doing quests, uh, exploring the map and unlocking chests and junk like that. Pretty much everything is going to give you adventure rank and you're going to end up getting it a lot, a lot, a lot early on in the game and it's going to end up getting a lot harder to do the further you get in the game because obviously you have a lot less to do because you have a lot less to unlock. Uh, if we end up opening up the journal here, this is where things are going to end up getting a bit more complicated, but as I said, we'll explain these in more detail uh, the further we get in the video. First of all, though, the big thing that I'm trying to point out to you guys is if you ever see this icon right here, this green 
um, AER or whatever. I, I don't even know what those initials are, but basically you can see by completing this objective, I'm getting at a hundred of that green experience. That is quite literally adventure rank. So anytime you see this tied to a quest, a dungeon, whatever, it means that you're going to be getting adventure rank. Now, the experience category of this book uh, of the adventures handbook or whatever is going to end up having various objectives that are going to end up increasing in difficulty the further you end up progressing in the book so it's going to end up having different chapters as the game refers to them all the way at chapter one you know you gotta find three waypoints open 15 chests upgrade a statue of the seven which we'll talk about what that is in a little bit later uh, and then once you end up completing all of that you'll end up uh getting the rewards that are right here uh so the chapter rewards as it were so that gives us more uh prima gems and artifact and some uh, a tribute uh leveling up scrolls that you can see right there uh it gets harder and harder the further you go but you end up getting different resources and different items and the items that you get slowly end up increasing in value etc etc right so you can always end up checking that to kind of give yourself an idea of what it is you can end up doing to progress the reason why i'm so stingy on certain categories like particularly enhancing eight artifacts to level eight is because i frankly don't have eight artifacts that i want to level up to eight that's it so moving on to the commissions commissions are going to end up being your daily grind and these are going to end up giving you probably the most adventure rank at least when you get later on in the game uh because by doing these you're going to end up not only gaining a daily amount of prima gems but you're also going to end up getting uh you know a bunch of uh, of adventure rank uh including again by completing all four of these objectives per day you will go to the adventurers guild and then you can turn it in and end up getting all of these other items right here so let's actually hop over to the adventurers guild just so i can kind of explain a little bit more of how adventure rank works and how you can end up just very very easily checking out any of the different categories of well adventure rank rewards and stuff also the reason i keep swapping off of razor is his idle animation he stretches and it's like really annoying so i just that's why but anyway there's gonna be this npc in any of the major cities in the game right now we only have two major cities but obviously they're going to add more to the game as the game develops uh but you'll end up talking to this chick eventually you'll end up unlocking the ability to talk to her because you're not going to have it at the beginning um and then there's going to be the adventure rank rewards so as you end up leveling up in adventure rank you're going to end up getting these various rewards you can see what it unlocks uh per each level and stuff like that uh at adventure rank 16 that's gonna be the big one for a lot of you because that's going to end up unlocking co-op so you can end up playing with your friends and stuff like that okay and the way that the co-op works is uh, i'll just mention briefly you're gonna go to your friends list and this is where you end up like uh, seeing your friends this is how you end up adding people by their id and this is where you'll see uh recent players so in order to add someone by their ID, you will literally just start typing it in. Uh, you can always see your ID in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And more important than that, uh, if you're using mouse and keyboard, I don't think you can do this on controller. I'm not sure. But you can see my UID way up at the top right under the picture of uh, Razor. And as far as I've heard on mouse and keyboard, I don't play on mouse and keyboard. You can just click on the UID and copy that. And then you can just share it in a text chat or something like that with your friends. So that's an easy way that you can end up just adding each other and joining each other and stuff like that. Unfortunately, there is a friend list limit which obviously isn't going to affect most players. But for me, I just like having you guys join my adventures and stuff like that. But that's okay, because even if you don't have people added on your friends list, you still can request to join their world based on their ID. You just have to search for that player for their ID. And then instead of adding them because their friends list might be full, like me, you can still request to join. So anyways, that is the most important aspect of Adventure Rank is as you end up leveling it up further and further, you'll end up getting various rewards for it and stuff like that. So speaking of the daily commissions, it seems that I completed all my daily commissions, but I didn't end up claiming my daily adventure rewards for doing all those commissions so there you go you get to actually see it right there first and foremost okay uh as you play further in the game you're also going to end up getting expeditions so 
sending characters on i don't even have anyone on an expedition that's weird you can send certain characters on expeditions you'll unlock more and more categories to end up sending characters to expeditions so for example i can end up sending uh, like a total of four people at a time uh, and quite literally this character that I'm sending on expedition, I will not be able to use until they are finished with their expedition. So be careful if you're at the beginning of the game or, well, I guess you can't really do expeditions early on in the game, but the point is watch out which characters you send because you don't want to accidentally end up sending your main. Uh, I only sent these characters just because I don't really use them. Uh, you can always recall them, which is neat, but I don't really use them. And as you saw, certain characters are going to end up having certain, uh, you know, certain bonuses uh, in the amount of time that it takes them to complete their objective. This is dependent on the um, on the region. So this is uh, the region of Liyue and this is the region of Mondstadt. So these different characters have, uh, you know, different bonuses that ends up basically making their expedition complete faster it's not super duper important uh but expedition is just kind of extra resources i guess yeah um so that should end up covering adventure rank domains and bosses and stuff like that we'll talk about those a little bit later because we have to talk about the map and exploration now so you can always end up pulling up your map easy peasy and there's going to end up being all these different areas and biomes and whatever else uh, zones let's call them but then there's also going to end up being the regions so from here and up this is the monstad region up over here i don't know if this is still categorized as monstad's region but you'll end up unlocking this by progressing through the main story and eventually this is going to end up being like a dragon's region it's really small uh down here however is going to be the region of liu Wei. now each of the regions is going to end up having a different elemental theme so liu Wei's theme is going to be geo which is the earth element uh while monstad is animo which is the wind element right as you end up exploring, you're going to end up getting fast travel points. These are signified as fast travel points. Uh, the game is always going to show these on your map, which is really nice, but you'll have to manually travel to them in order to activate them. Uh, fun fact, you can activate fast travel points while you have other players in your world in multiplayer, uh, but you will not be able to interact with any NPCs. Thus, you won't be able to interact with any statues of the seven, unfortunately. So... If you're playing with your friends and you get to a statue of the seven in order to activate it you're gonna have to kick your friends out activate the statue and then invite them back in which is fine it's just kind of annoying they might end up patching that out a little bit later because we do kind of already know what's going to be happening with the patch next week version 1.1 um they already did talk about a lot of different things including and this is important because the map might look a little bit different to those of you that are playing after version 1.1 has come out is the game itself is going to end up showing so based on whispering woods right here this counts as kind of a different zone let's call it and it's going to show a percentage of the zone being completed so that'll be related to how many chests have you gathered have you gotten all of the oculus which we'll talk about oculus items in a bit and it's going to be a really neat way that you can categorize and section off. Okay, so I've completed everything in all of these areas, except I haven't, I'm missing some stuff in Wolvendom, right? So it's going to be a very cool way that completionists can end up making sure that they end up exploring and getting absolutely everything out of the way. But first, let's talk about the Statue of the Seven. So Statue of the Seven is going to end up giving you a fast travel point, but it is also going to end up acting as kind of a safe haven, right? So you can end up interacting with this at any time uh, and you can end up doing various things. You can end up going into the statue's blessing and this is going to change, like you can literally change how much it will end up recovering your party, whether or not it even automatically recovers your party. So I just have it to recover my party 100% of their health when I stand nearby, right? It has a limited amount of restorative power, but it will slowly generate over time. It's I've never ran into the problem of actually having this thing run out of heals during my play sessions, okay? But I'm just saying that it is there, which is kind of weird. I guess that's why you could turn it off. But the point is that, again, if you're in co-op, you won't be able to interact with the statue, so you wouldn't be able to manually get healed from it, right? And then, more important than that, is going to end up being the statue's worshipping. So, 
in order to worship a statue, you're going to have to collect what the game calls an oculus or an oculi. So you can see that this requires uh, the the wind oculi or the animo oculi or the animoculus as it shows in the top right. There is a limited amount of this item in the Mondstadt region. This is going to end up, like I said, it's going to end up having the different biome theme or the different region theme or whatever you want to call it. So in Mondstadt, you're going to be collecting Animoculus or Wind Oculus, whereas when you go to Liyue, you're going to be uh, collecting the G Oculus or Earth Oculus, right? So as they end up uh, adding more and more regions to the game, you will basically have to start gathering uh, different oculi, uh, and so on and so forth. And by spending them at these Statues of the Seven, you will end up slowly but surely increasing certain stats, but more importantly, increasing your stamina, because stamina is going to be in limited supply for running and dodging and stuff, uh, as well as climbing, because the cool thing about this game, as I mentioned it being very similar to Breath of the Wild, is that you can actually climb virtually every surface in the entire game. And you can either climb super duper slow or you can start jump spamming and that is going to consume a lot more stamina, but you can use it to end up climbing a lot faster. And obviously as you get more stamina, it allows you to explore a lot more often and a lot easier because you don't gotta worry about your stamina regening all the time. And you can also glide absolutely everywhere. Swimming is also going to drain stamina. If you get to zero stamina, you will end up drowning. I don't really like the swimming in this game. Certain characters, though, like Mona, actually can just run on water. So that's kind of cool and interesting. I'm guessing they'll end up doing something like that later when we get like a volcanic biome uh, or region and there's going to be like lava and stuff. I don't know. But as of right now, that's pretty much all there is to it in terms of just the map and exploration. And that is already going to end up being... Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of things to do. Uh, we're still talking about the map and exploration. I'm just trying to say, like, that's kind of all the big movement abilities. Uh, so anyways, as you're exploring the world, there's going to end up being these Animoculus, uh, Geoculus, Oculus items, whatever. I already have them all, so keep that in mind. But sometimes you'll just be exploring the map and you might end up seeing uh, an icon very similar to the Wish icon right here. And if you ever end up seeing, sorry, I didn't mean to go in that category. If you ever end up seeing that icon on your map, it means that there's an Oculus nearby. Now with version 1.1, uh, they've also shown that there is going to end up being a sort of, um, sort of an Oculus radar as it were, right? Um, the Oculus Radar, uh, from what we've seen, is literally going to be an item that you will end up crafting and using based off of how high your region level is within the city, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. It's currently not in the game, so I don't fully understand it, but we'll still uh, cover it. Um, but you'll end up using this Geoculus Radar, and it'll just kind of send a pulse out around your character uh, to a limited a, a limited amount it kind of just focuses on a very specific area so you can use that as an in-game way to end up slowly tracking down all of the oculus and like i said you're going to end up seeing a, a percentage category in each of these different zones so you'll be able to kind of gauge for yourself whether or not you're missing oculus or missing chess and stuff like that that said I will put a link in the description and highly recommend that you end up checking out the uh, there's kind of like a user interactive map that players have created and you can use this map to quite literally mark oculus that you've collected um, it shows where they all are so maybe if you want to explore everything in game yourself that's fun too. but I would recommend even if you're starting at the beginning of the game and you find it to be overly daunting. Anytime you pick up an Oculus, make sure that you use that map because so long as you're logged into your Google account, because it's basically a Google Doc or some type of Google thing, whatever. Make sure, and it's not going to steal your data, make sure that you always, 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 even at the beginning of the game, even if you're not going out of your way to collect every single Oculus, make sure that you bring up that interactive map and mark that you've collected that Oculus, okay? It's going to help you in the long run. I didn't do that. And so I had to spend hours and hours scouring every single area in the game just to confirm, oh, I already got that Oculus. 
oh, I already got that one and so on and so forth. So even if you don't go out of your way to collect them all, which I still highly recommend that you do, because obviously it gives you more stamina. Uh, I highly recommend that you start using the map right off the hop and make sure that you mark down religiously any of the Oculus that you get, because it's going to help you in the long run especially as they end up adding more and more different regions to the game. So next is going to end up being chess. And then there, we're going to be talking about uh, those little spirit wolf things. I, I think that's called a seeker. I'm not exactly sure, but the thing that you can see kind of just hovering in the distance, very convenient that we got both of these here. So this is a common chest. Uh, there's going to be different grades of chests that you'll end up finding out in the world. Certain chests will end up respawning uh, like each day randomly. So people can chest farm, but for the most part, I just find a chest once you open it and you'll never see it again. Uh, in the version 1.1, we are also going to be getting an item that is a sort of chest radar. So again, we'll be able to uh, deduce based on the percentage of each of the zones. Oh, I, well, I, for example, already have all the Animoculus. So clearly if I had you know, 98% in Whispering Woods, it means that more than likely that's going to end up being a chest that I'm missing. And so I could go into that area and then start using the chest radar. The chests are gonna end up giving you uh, various items to level up your characters, artifacts, stuff like that. Sometimes you'll end up getting four star weapons and junk like that. There's also going to end up being uh, specific invisible chests and stuff that you might have to complete a certain objective or uh, maybe there will be like a stump and you got to stand on it and then a chest appears or a bunch of enemies will end up being surrounding a chest and after you defeat them all the chest will end up unlocking and stuff like that lots of really cool interesting stuff and kind of little puzzles that you might have to solve as you're out exploring the world that are again really really fun and gonna come in mass quantity early on so as you progress further in the game and you've unlocked more and more of these chests, it's going to get a lot harder to track down the chests and thus a lot harder to get more attribute leveling scrolls and stuff like that. So that's why, you know, if you checked out the category of talking about characters, I said be careful which ones you decide to main because you're going to be getting plenty of supplies early on, but that's just going to get a lot more difficult later on, at least right now, just because we only have the two regions in the game but they're gonna be adding a total of like seven regions. So once that actually comes into the game, obviously it's gonna be a lot easier for new players to just go crazy with leveling up whatever they want, right? But they might end up increasing a leveling cap as well. So who knows? Uh, we'll go and talk to or check out that seeker in a moment. Cause I just wanna mention very briefly that by going to certain areas of the world, you'll end up getting certain uh, resources. So food items are used for cooking, which we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but you can also end up finding like, you know, maybe a flower on the side of a mountain in the Leoway region that will end up being an ascension or, you know, an ascension material that you might be able to use on a very specific character. So certain characters will actually cost flowers and junk like that in order to end up leveling up. So you can still uh, use that interactive map to sort by certain resources and then you can see where they all are and print out the map if you want or save it on your desktop whatever uh, and then you can just draw a path of okay so for today i'm going to go here and i'm going to walk this path to end up gathering all of these materials so that i can use them to level up my main character kind of thing mm, right which we're still going to get into the category of domains and stuff because domains and dungeons and junk are also going to end up being where you can end up getting certain supplies that interactive map i don't think has every item on the map or anything like that but it's still really handy uh so this i'm just gonna call it a seeker because i have no idea what else it's called these quite literally are gonna be things that you touch and then they'll just start moving and by following them around some of them are gonna be a lot harder to follow uh they will end up leading you towards a torch shrine thing whatever uh, anyways they're going to end up leading you to an area and then unlocking a chest so we'll just kind of keep following this guy to give you guys an example so we can see that he's actually heading right over here. Now, one thing that the game is going to teach you as you end up going to some of the earlier dungeons in the, in the game is that you can always pull up this elemental, whoops, uh, this elemental vision. 
Now, something to keep in mind is that anytime you end up seeing these little statues and maybe you don't see the seeker, you can go to your elemental vision and it's quite literally going to point you in the direction that the seeker is. So the seeker right now is kind of standing on the, um, the like that little smoke trail that's right beside him. Get out of my way, please. That little smoke trail that you see is actually the statue pointing us in the direction of the seeker. So the seeker started right over there. So it's literally pointing us in the direction of it, right? And then, ba 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 bum, we just got ourselves a chest, which gave us like a bunch of enhancement ore and whatever else, right? Okay, cool. So now let's move on to talking about cooking, which is going to end up being a very short category itself because it's very, very self explanative. Um, as of right now, this version of the game, you have to go to a cooking pot. Uh, and you will have to have a fire next to it or, you know, a campfire or whatever. So this is where you might end up using a fire character to light the campfire on fire. And then you can interact with it. Unfortunately, if the game's raining or, you know, if it's too cold or whatever, you usually can't end up setting the fireplace on fire, which is unfortunate. But in version 1.1, 1 .1, uh, as you end up gaining more, uh, uh, again, region uh, experience or whatever, uh, you'll end up getting a portable cooking pot. So you can use that uh, when version 1.1 comes out uh, next week, at least at the time that I'm recording this video. So anyways, as we go into the food category, you can see uh, there's recipes that you'll just end up finding out in the world and unlocking and stuff like that. And then there's just going to end up being these individual foods that will all have different functions. Some of them will end up buffing your characters, increasing their defense or attack or whatever. Certain characters will have a favorite food, which is going to end up being significantly more powerful when they end up consuming it. Uh, and then there's going to end up being these items like steak and fried eggs and stuff that will be used to resurrect a character. Because if you die, you pretty much are just going to respawn somewhere uh, if your whole party wipes. Or you can end up, uh, you know, if one of your characters dies, but the rest of your party is fine, you can resurrect them uh, with a food item. The game is also going to end up including uh, an item in version 1.1 that's currently not in the game that will automatically consume food when certain conditions are met. Obviously, it not being in game means I don't fully understand how it's going to work. But as far as I know, it means that if a character is about to die, you can tell it to automatically consume an egg. So that character is just instantly going to res, I think. And then maybe it'll end up consuming food afterwards to end up healing out or something. Because as of right now, you can still just hop into your inventory, go over to the cooking section, and you can start eating food like a madman while you're in the middle of battle, which is really easy when you're in single player just because when you go into this menu it's going to freeze the game but when you're in co-op the action never stops so you're gonna have to be careful and choose when you end up deciding to eat your food and junk like that now as far as the cooking is concerned it's very simple uh at first you're going to have to do a kind of cooking mini game where you're going to have to press the button within a certain time frame uh but as you end up cooking certain foods to uh, you know cooking enough of a certain food you'll end up unlocking auto cooking and then you can just select the quantity that you want to cook and then just click auto cook and it's just going to do it for you and be perfectly timed because the whole point is that before that you have to cook each individual item one at a time and you have to get it within the time frame in order to end up giving it the perfect stat which basically means that it's just going to be better than a sloppy one that's just like gross and weird yeah, so as you get recipe items, they're going to end up unlocking more food as well. Uh, certain food items you might not be able to craft too often, but I mean, you can see right here, this is going to end up costing a lot, a lot, a lot of different resources. And if I was using mouse and keyboard, I could hover over the meat or the crab and see where I end up getting those items. Um, I don't know if I can on controller, but anyways, let's move on to the next category. So this is going to end up being processing. Uh, so you'll like literally process food items out of certain resources so in order to craft flour we have to get wheat wheat is just found out in the world and once we end up processing it we can then use wheat to craft some of the more complicated foods like this one right here which i do still have some wheat but i'm still missing pepper or whatever that's called maybe it's jam or maybe i just frankly don't have the processing recipe 
Anyways, that's how the food works. Now, a couple other things to mention before we start talking about region levels, which again, you're gonna have to bear with me, is not currently in the game that I'm recording this right now, uh, but it is coming next week. Region levels are literally going to be something related to, I think it's just related to the percentage you have in each of the zones and exploration. And then that is going to end up leveling up your region level. So for example, we're in the Mondstadt region. So as we collect more chests and collect more uh, Animoculus and stuff, we'll end up leveling up in our region, which will end up giving us access to these various items that I've mentioned that aren't currently in the game, like portable cooking and what have you. Uh, there will end up being a portable waypoint as well. So you can literally plop down a fast travel point wherever you want. You can only put one down at a time and it's going to end up disintegrating after seven days. The reason for this is I'm pretty sure that you're going to have to craft multiple of them. It's not just an item that you craft once and you're done with it. So keep that in mind. Uh, again, it's not in the game right now, so I could be wrong about that. Another thing too is if you ever find yourself at nighttime and maybe you don't like night in particular, you can end up going to the time or clock right here and you can set it to any specific amount of time that you want, easy peasy. Uh, certain quests might end up requiring you to be at a certain time of day. So it's really, really nice that we have this uh, in the game for the map system and just exploration and junk like that and then as you're exploring the game and you might want to take some pictures so you can go to photo mode which is pretty lackluster right now i'm hoping that they end up improving upon this all you can really do is zoom in and out uh you can end up changing the width of the picture and what have you you can go into extra categories and set kind of the horizontal view so your character's on the sidelines. You can blur the background, choose how close the blurred background is, hide your personal information in your character, hide the UI, and then you take a screenshot. But the problem is that this doesn't actually freeze the gameplay. So if you want your character to be in a specific pose, you might have to wait uh, because there's only like a handful of poses right now, like standing, thinking, or the alpha pose, and then that's it. And you can't take any pictures while you're in the middle of combat because obviously if you try to do this, an enemy is just going to start destroying you. So keep those things in mind. Now, as we move into the city here, we're going to be talking about some of the NPCs just very briefly. Uh, I figured that this does still count kind of in the map slash exploration category before we end up moving on to talking about domains and daily bosses and junk like that. Uh, so the blacksmith, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be where you'll craft, uh, you know, the ores or enhancement enhancement ore which is used for leveling up your gear you will also periodically find blueprints out in the world that you can then spend to end up crafting certain weapons obviously the point being that you could craft duplicates of these weapons so that you can end up you know combining them together and making these weapons stronger but i mean are they going to end up being ones that you actually want to use well that's entirely up to you Souvenir shop right over here is going to end up having a limited quantity of items that you can end up spending a uh, 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 weird region related resource. So this one requires you to spend the, uh, does it show what it costs? Well, it's a weird animo, like you can see that it costs like 10 or four or whatever of this weird animo resource. And I think you just get those by being out and exploring and doing quests and stuff like that. I. I could be wrong. I, I think there's a limited amount of these because I only have 36 and I don't think like that seems pretty low, honestly speaking. So you got to keep that in mind when you're buying these items that these are a limited amount. So you got to be very careful about them. Oh, never mind. It's saying I own three of this item. The resource that I have to purchase, I have no idea. Oh, I have 806. Well, never mind then. But more importantly is going to end up being, uh, you know, general goods will buy general items. Uh, food is going to be for buying food items. And then there's going to be the alchemist, which we'll talk about the alchemist in a bit, just because as I mentioned earlier, enemies in the map are going to end up dropping various resources. And then there's going to end up being bosses. So bosses will end up dropping their own resources. Now, the enemies that you end up fighting on the world uh, will end up dropping various resources that you can use the alchemist to combine. Okay? Same with world bosses. So, for example, let me take something really, really simple here. Uh, the essential oil, for example. You'll end up getting this from fighting elemental flowers out in the world, and then you... Or, or apparently you can just craft this from a raw material, so keep that in mind. 
Uh, but you'll end up getting various items from enemies or just, you know, out in the world while exploring, what have you. And the point is that these are going to end up being, it, literally as it shows, a weapon ascension material, a, a character enhancement material, whatever. Um, so as you end up leveling up a character, leveling up a weapon, it will end up costing a higher quality version of this item. And so you can combine your crappier versions of these items into the higher quality versions. Of course, it's going to be like a two by one ratio or further than that even. So it gets really, really expensive in order to end up crafting these. But the point is that it is there as an option. And going back to AR or adventure rank, if you end up increasing your world level, the enemies will end up having a chance of dropping that higher quality crafting and ascension material. So now let's move on to the bosses and thus talk about the resin system. So the resin system, uh, resin is going to end up being a resource that you have in limited quantity every day. Uh, so you can see right now at the moment I'm recording this video anyways, our daily limit is 120. As you spend resin, it's going to slowly regenerate. I think it's every eight minutes you get one back, okay? So basically, if you have 120, the goal is that the game tries to make itself as addicting as possible because you want to always spend all of your resin possible so that you are being the most efficient at the game and spending all of the resources, which I don't really care about that. I just enjoy the game and play it when I can. Um, but there's going to be so many different things that are going to be locked behind this resin system, which is very unfortunate. Uh, so we can either do these ley lines. These are going to be quests that I don't think they're infinite, but they'll just keep spawning uh, and they can give you uh, adventure rank as well as companion XP. And then uh, you can see that it's giving us the experience scrolls that you can end up using uh, to level up characters and stuff like that. Or you could end up going and finding a world boss. And as you can see here, it's showing all of its possible uh, possible awards uh, rewards. I mean, which includes like various drops items, uh, like artifacts and ascension materials and junk like that, as well as adventure rank. And it's going to cost 40 resin. So if we go and kill this boss, this is a daily boss. Uh, it means that in order to collect the drops from the boss, you're going to have to spend resin. You will not get the drop if you do not have any resin in your inventory in order to end up spending and getting the resource. So I'm at 38 resin right now. I would have to wait until I got up to 40, then kill the boss. Now, the interesting thing is that while some of these bosses are going to be on a daily timer, lesser bosses or mini bosses that you might find out in the world, those guys are going to end up being on hourly timers, not one hour and then they respawn. I don't know what the timing is for them, but say I kill a rune guardian, which is like this giant golem dude, they're going to end up spawning a couple times per day rather than a world boss like this, which is going to spawn once per day. Now, these guys aren't tied to a world, uh, an hourly timer, which means that they're literally tied to the daily reset. So you could kill it, wait for the daily reset to hit, and then you could kill it again. Uh, the other thing too, though, is that you can actually join your friend's worlds, and if they haven't killed the boss in their world, you'll be able to kill it, and then you can actually get the resource again. So that's pretty cool. As opposed to weekly bosses, you can only get their rewards once. Even if you join your friend's world and help them kill the boss, it will not allow you to get the items from the boss again. So this is where players want to try and get the highest world level possible because obviously you're going to end up getting better and better gear from the bosses and from everything basically by having your world level higher but it means that it's going to be a lot more difficult so you got to make sure that you have the right characters to invest in later on uh like you'll end up getting this uh this world weekly boss is going to be unlocked later on in the quests uh same with up here there's going to be the storm terror domain uh and as you you know, confront Storm Terror, you're going to have options to fight higher and higher versions of him. Uh, and whoops, I don't know why it does that. Uh, Storm Terror is a boss that you can only fight yourself. You have to do it solo and it's going to be a weekly boss. And then there's going to be Boreas uh, or whatever the wolf boss. He's going to be another weekly boss, but you can do him with your friends. Uh, when version 1.1 comes out, they're going to be adding Child as a weekly boss as well, I think. 
Uh, I'm not sure whether you can fight him with your friends or not. I think he's just going to be a one-time deal. But the thing that's crazy is because of the limited amount of resin that you have, you actually won't be able to clear all of the weekly world bosses and get their rewards the day the week resets. So it resets every Monday. But I just think that that's funny and lots of players are really criticizing that because it's like it doesn't give you the option of just getting them all done and out of the way in one session. You're going to have to kill like one or two of them and then wait. And then if you want to get world bosses on top of that, good luck. Uh, again, world bosses are going to end up giving you uh, character ascension material and stuff like that. Weekly bosses as well, but weekly bosses can also give you much better artifacts and stuff like that. Now we're moving on to the domains. So there's going to be two different things here. There's going to be whatever these are. I just call these ones like mini dungeons or temples. Uh, basically, if you see this icon on the map that has the little square in the middle of it or the little blue diamond, that's going to be a dungeon that you'll complete once to get rewards and then you never have to complete it again. And then this icon right here, which is very similar but has a circle in it, this is going to be a domain where you can go into this co-op or yourself and it's literally just gonna be go into this room and fight up wave wave after wave of enemies and then spend resin in order to end up getting the resources afterwards now these are going to end up changing some of them are going to be on a weekly timer some of them are going to end up being on a daily timer whatever or not a weekly timer sorry they're all on a daily timer it's just certain days of the week they'll end up dropping certain resources so you can see this one changes daily as you can see so monday and thursday it's going to drop these items tuesday and friday it's going to drop these items and yes these are all different yeah so go crazy guys um this is where the adventures handbook really comes in handy because you can actually literally look at all of the domains uh to end up seeing which ones will drop which items so you can see this is weapon ascension materials this uh the top one actually drops artifacts and you can always go into each of these to look and see okay which set is this domain dropping so this is going to drop the thundering fury set it's always going to show the flower but it's not limited to the flower artifact it can drop feathers helmets whatever else it can drop the entire set of this artifact so it's just going to show you one of them instead of showing you all of them right so this is where you would get the tiny miracle set so on and so forth uh you can get various items through here and just kind of cycle through this category as you unlock more domains you'll end up seeing more of them uh, and you can always see where they're located uh you can always see certain resources might be on you know like when i'm ascending my weapon for example i can see what item it needs and it might be like oh this is only available from this domain on wednesday stuff like that then there's also going to end up being the spiral abyss which I mean, I guess we can talk about that in a bit, but let's move on to the bosses. So as you end up discovering more bosses in the world, it's going to be able to show you pretty much all of them. This is going to be a mini boss that you can just find out in the world. These are bosses that are on an hourly timer. And if you click navigate, it will show you where one is. You could kill it and then you navigate to that mini boss in your book again and click navigate and it's going to show a different one. It only shows these mini bosses one at a time. Uh, and then you can always end up going to the actual world bosses. Uh, and these ones, it's going to show like whether it's respawning or not. So this is the electro cube. Uh, you know, this is a world boss that I often fight just because it gives me electro resources to ascend razor, which is my electric character. Um, other electric characters will end up using similar resources. So anyways, we could go and kill this guy and then it would say whether or not it was respawning. So I guess that means that I didn't kill it for this day. Okay, whatever. Uh, but then you can also see... Here's an example right here showing the weekly boss. This is the, you know, the wolf boss that I was talking about. Where it's going to take... What is that? 69 hours before it refreshes. So whatever that is. I wish that it would just say days or something like that. But anyways, really, really handy that it shows you all this stuff. And then you can end up, you know, seeing the details of each of the items. And where they'll drop and stuff like that. So this, for example, is... Uh, as I mentioned at the alchemist, you can end up crafting the lower tiered materials into the higher tiered ones. Or if you fight a level 60 version of this mob, it can end up dropping this item, which is the higher tier. So moving on to the spiral abyss, 
Honestly, you guys shouldn't really ask me too much about this. I understand the concept of it and how it works. Uh, I don't really enjoy the Spiral Abyss, so I don't really do it. But basically, the Spiral Abyss is going to give you various rewards for completing various floors. And once you get to a certain point, uh, you will be able to do weekly rewards. So there's going to be various rewards that you can end up getting for completing the Spiral Abyss that is going to reset every two weeks so that you could then do it again and again and again. And these range from like Prima Gems and level up materials and junk like that. You get some pretty nifty items from the Spiral Abyss once you end up getting to the uh, uh, the higher category. So you can see I'm not even at the highest category where I can get to the Abyss Moon Spire, it says down at the bottom there. And that's where you can end up getting uh, the treasure that's going to be on a to weekly rotation right so the thing is that when you're in there like the, the spiral abyss is really really difficult and really really cheap in a lot of ways because certain enemies will end up just stun locking you and unfortunately you can't do spiral abyss in co-op the reason for this if i'm being perfectly honest is the spiral abyss ends up giving you like prima gems and stuff which can be spent on wishes but you have to have your characters be really high level. And as you get further in the Spiral Abyss, you can actually have two separate teams of a group of four characters. So basically what the game wants you to do is have eight characters be really, really powerful and have really, really tough gear, thus promoting the idea of spending money on the game because it's going to give you an edge and help you to level those characters up a lot faster and generally get you stronger characters because of the constellations attributes what have you that's what i see the spiral abyss as is just a way to in uh, incentivize players to sink money into it that said you still get some pretty nifty rewards out of the spiral abyss it's just i could care less about the gameplay of it i just found it to be really boring because i just got stun locked by mages and other bosses and junk like that and it's just like Ugh. uh so anyways now we can use that sweet segue to talk about last but not least the shop the shop is going to be very simple uh but also uh, it has a lot of layers to it uh as far as i've read this is a very similar system to any other gacha game where they try to make the shop as confusing as possible just so that the player doesn't really know the value of items that they're getting and i can attest to this because i've never experienced a gotcha game before i've played mobile games before but i never spent money on any mobile games uh, i have spent mo money on like pay to win pc games and online mmorpg games and stuff like that but i've never spent money on a gacha game nor do i think that i'm going to spend any more money on genshin at least unless they end up adding some sort of incentive for me to do it i mean maybe i'll spend more money on it once i can actually start saving some money but as of right now real life costs are a lot higher so i don't really care about spending money on this game so anyways there's various options of things that you can buy. Uh, the Blessing of the Welkin Moon is pretty much your best value because you're going to spend a certain amount of money and you have to log in for 30 days and each individual day you're going to end up getting 90 Prima Gems for a total of 2,700. The reason that this is important and cool is because if you are just buying Genesis Crystals, this is basically you'll end up buying genesis crystal and then you can exchange genesis crystal into prima gems it's going to be a lot more expensive to go that route than it does to go the recommended route also not to get too deep into it but apparently this is something that gacha games do is by having this in place it mentally gets you ready to log into the game regularly and thus spend more time on it and potentially end up spending more money every everything about the game is very 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 ingeniously developed to keep you playing and to incentivize you to spend money now i'm not saying this as a criticism towards the game i'm just saying to be aware of it because it's very dangerous I already ended up falling down the rabbit hole for a little while there where I ended up spending well over $600 trying to get one character that I wanted and I didn't get the character that I wanted and it really opened my eyes up to oh that's what people meant when they said this is a gacha system this is literally like going to a casino and just hitting a slot machine it's gambling at this point it is 100% random you may never end up getting what you want out of it 
and the rates that you need to spend in order to actually end up winning and getting the things that you want out of it are thousands of dollars which i frankly am not going to spend towards this game maybe i will slowly over time but not all at once like some other youtubers out there that have like they must have like 10 grand a month from their videos or something like that i'm not making that much dude i'm just making minimum wage for canada and i mean good god you can see these packs are super expensive for me uh but anyways as you end up spending on the wishes and stuff like that uh you will end up getting uh star glitter and star dust for every like four star and five star item that you end up getting duplicates of uh maybe you just get the these resources as well uh these are going to be items that are going to be on a monthly limit and you will be able to kind of you know it, it's kind of a pay to win way where uh, obviously it's limited per month but it's a pay to win way that you can end up uh spending your money on wishes and prima gems and stuff like that to potentially end up getting stardust so that you can exchange it for ascension materials and all of this other stuff right there's also going to end up being the monthly amount of fates that you can get which is just giving you more wishes as well star glitter is going to be the more difficult one and thus it's going to end up being in less supply and way more expensive to end up buying these ascension materials some weapons and certain characters per month so far, I've only seen four star characters. I don't think they're going to do it with five star characters. But the point is that if I, you know, I have Bennett, for example, and if I ended up spending my star glitter on this other Bennett, that would give me a duplicate of him so that I could get his constellation. Thus, you can see the cycle of it being pay to win. Even if it's in limited supply, it still is a pay to win option, especially because you can kind of exchange your failed wishes for even more fates so that you can end up getting even more wishes you see where we're going with this yeah there's also going to end up being the gift shop which you have to spend your crystals on crystals is kind of just the raw currency that can be then exchanged for prima gems which then has to be exchanged for fates for wishes and stuff like that but anyways uh starter supply bundle and wayfarer supply bundle these you can buy once per week uh, but the pack itself is actually going to include a lot of items that will end up just leveling up your characters and stuff, as well as a fragile resin, which can be consumed to end up giving you 60 more resin immediately, right? So this is yet again, another pay to win, even if time gating the amount of money that you can spend on this, but there's no time gate for the wishes in general, right? And then on top of that, as if that wasn't bad enough, there's also a battle pass. And the battle pass, though okay, uh, is kind of weird. It's, it's just strange that the battle pass is in this game. Uh, so you'll end up, you can see all the items that are in the top category. That's all the items that you can get for free without spending any money. The battle pass would have swapped over uh, in like a couple days, by the way. It's, uh, what does it say? Three days from the time that I'm recording this video, you'll see a different battle pass. So there will be different items. Um, but there's going to be two different options, uh, price options that you can get for the battle pass. But before we get into that, in order to end up, uh, you know, leveling up the battle pass, you can either literally purchase levels, which of course requires Prima gems, which is cash shot pay to win, you know, same as, same as Fortnite, basically. It's just kind of a standard battle pass. You all should know how this works, but, uh, there's going to be daily missions, weekly missions, uh, and then just during the battle pass period, it has like big boy objectives. And by completing all of these, you'll end up getting more experience to the battle pass, or you can spend money to end up leveling up the battle pass. Uh, or, and then there's also going to end up being a bounty, which is kind of the special reward for the battle pass. Right now we've got all these different four star weapons, which some of them are pretty good. Um, you have to get the battle pass to level 30 in order to access one of these, I, I think. Yeah, you can select a weapon of your choice. So you only get one of them. So we'll see what future battle passes do. But then further than that, uh, you can also end up unlocking two different categories of the battle pass. So the one on the left is going to end up unlocking uh, the bottom category of items. So if I bought the battle pass right now, I'm already uh, battle pass level 30. So I would get all these items down here and you get quite a bit of stuff out of it. It doesn't seem like much, but it adds up. Most of all, the Mora, the gold that you end up getting out of it is pretty insane. 
that said, I'm, like I said, very, very reluctant to spending more money on this game just because I already spent so much trying to get what I wanted and I didn't get what I want. Uh, anyways, there's also going to end up being this pass right here. This is the more expensive one that will instantly give you 10 levels to the battle pass, uh, as well as giving you a couple fragile resin and a uh, name card that is just some vanity item that shows up behind your character. It's not really worth it to get this pack outside of the fact that it gives you 10 level and gives you uh the five resin so maybe the fact that it increases your level by 10 i i think the battle pass has like okay i i think it might always have the same amount of xp in order to level up maybe it slowly scales and gets harder and harder so maybe you would want to buy that later in the pass's lifespan but i don't know and I think that pretty much covers everything, gamers. I, I hope so, anyways. I might be missing a few things, but... I mean, for the most part, the game is going to end up teaching you a lot of the other basic minimum things of the game anyways. I know that this video was long as hell, but I'm going to put timestamps for every single category. So hopefully it was something that you ended up finding helpful in one way or another. And if you did, I would appreciate if you would smash like, sub for more because I'm going to be covering Genshin in the future as well. And I just keep covering it regularly. Not to mention, we got the snow update coming in December. That's actually adding a new area. Not a full-on region, just kind of a smaller area. It's adding that uh, snow mountain over there. So I'm really excited to start exploring again because the exploration in this game is just... I love it. That's my favorite part of the game. But anyways, thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Sign on and stay up with gamers.